Deborah Piñatelli has, uh, is very well known and, uh, uh, on, on New Hampshire. She was a state representative. She was, first, before she began to be a politician, she, was, uh, he run, she runs the Boys and Girls Club. That's Just the Girls Club. Just the Girls Club. <laughs> OK. But she, I, I'm sure she was ca capable to run both of them. I'm not of that. That's for sure. I don't have a doubt. And um, she has been a state representative, and she has been senator, and she is on the executive council now. Thanks God. And that is a very difficult, one of the most difficult positions to run as a candidate is the executive council. It's very difficult to run. One of the reasons is a lot of people, they don't really know what the executive council do. And that is a very challenging to run a campaign when a lot of people, they don't know exactly what the executive council will do, but they are very, very important. And I can assure you, thanks to the executive council we have now, and, um, and thanks to, um, the, to Deborah Pignatelli, the things are not, are, it could be much worse if she is not there. So there is, a, a, for me, an honor and a pleasure to, in, to, uh, to introduce to you Deborah Pignatelli. And also I want to welcome Mike Pignatelli, her husband. He's a, a good friend. He's a, he's a very good lawyer. And uh, if you have any legal problems, talk with him. Um, I, I already, I'm, I am a, a chair of, uh, of an, um, a chair of one organization that is a GSOP. Board member, I'm sorry, no, I'm not chair. I'm chair uh, and there is an, um, an, uh, Deborah Pin uh, and Michael Pignatelli and his firm have given us a lot of help on creating a C4 organization. So thank you, Mike. So there is a, without further introduction, please, uh, we, we a round of applause to, uh, to give a welcome to Deborah Pignatelli. Thank you very much. Thank you. So as uh, Alejandro said, my name is Deborah Pignatelli. I uh, live in Nashua with my husband, Mike. We have raised uh, two children, Adam and Benjamin. And Adam now is married to Jessica, and they have two boys, Ethan and Miles. Our other son, Benjamin, is married to Lizzie uh, Carr Pignatelli. And uh, of all things, we only produce boys in our family. Mike is one of three boys. We had two boys. Our son had two boys. Ben just got married about three years ago, and he just had, wait for it, a girl, Lila, in January. So now we're starting to even a little bit up. But we have a way to go. But it's a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you. And uh, I'm so pleased that Alejandro asked me to come. Thank you to you and your team of Hudson Democrats who meet and do good things and put meetings together. And a special thanks to Vince and, and Bethany. Um, I guess she stepped out and Valerie for volunteering your time and your talent to good candidates. Um, we hope that we are able to elect a Democrat in 2020. Um, so um, I, am, uh, I have been a state representative from 1986 to 1991, five years, and then I ran for the state senate in 1992 and served for 10 years. Then I took a couple of years off, and in 2004, I took a look at who represented the district on the executive council, and I was not pleased with the individual who was my executive counselor. I didn't think he represented my views or the views of people like me, and I decided I would run for that seat. And I won in 2004 and served till 2010, where I lost in a big wave. Yeah. And then, I, you remember? Yeah. And then um, I came back in, yeah, I came back in 2012, ran again and was elected, and then in 2014, I needed a hip replacement. I could barely walk. 
when I got down on the floor with my grandchildren, I couldn't get back up. So I had the hip replacement, took a couple of years off, but now look, my hip does everything, I, you know, it's I'm back to, and I ran again in 2016, and so um, 2018, excuse me, and I'm on the council, this is my ninth year on the council. So a lot of people, the council has been in existence since our constitution was written, but hardly anybody knows about it because you know what your state representative does and your state senator, they're making the laws. Everybody knows what the governor does and everybody knows what the judiciary is, but hardly anybody knows what the executive council is. So we're a five member body we each represent one-fifth of the state geographically and population. So my district is District 5. I represent Hudson and Litchfield. You're from Litchfield, right? Yeah. I represent Hudson and Litchfield on the eastern side, and I go all the way over to just before Keene, Swansea and the area Troy, um, uh, Ringe, and Whipswich, and all the towns. I have 32 towns and the city of Nashua. So it's a very large district. There's about 270,000 people that I represent. And um, I love being on the executive council. Uh, it's almost like full circle for me because we don't make the laws. The House and the Senate make the laws and put the budget together. And I did that when I was in the House and the Senate. And on the executive council, we see where the money's spending. We have three major jobs. One of them is to um, approve any spending that the state does above $10,000. So any contracts, any money that's spent on any health and human services, any money that the state spends on anything has to be voted on by the executive council. A second major job is to approve the governor's judicial nominees and we, I have a story about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and a, and a, um, a third major um, job is to approve any nominee by the governor to head up our important state agencies. And we have a lot of state agencies like the Health and Human Services Department, the Attorney General, um, Environmental Services, Department of Revenue Administration, there's a lot of um, agencies. And also, there are about 200 boards and commissions um, that, are, um, that we have in the state. The Dental Board, the Medical Board, the Engineers Board, Fish and Game um, Committees, there's about 200 of them. And we are always looking, I am always looking for good people in the district who would like to serve uh, I see your, yeah, like to serve. I know you uh, were on the Conservation Commission, so thank you for that, but would like to serve on one of these boards. So if you think you have some time on your hands and you have some expertise, go to the Secretary of State's website and there is a listing of all the boards and commissions, a description of what they do, and also a listing of who's on them and when new terms come up. So if you want to do that, if you have an interest in doing that, I would encourage you, most people that volunteer for a board or commission find it really satisfying. Um, so there are, on the council now, since we're five members, three of us now are Democrats and two of us are Republicans. When I first joined the council in 2004, I was the only Democrat. And by the way, I was the only woman who's ever won in this district. <laughs> the first woman, and the only woman. And, um, and I, I, um, I, en I enjoy it, but the council now is made up of three Democrats and two Republicans. And like I was saying, in 2004 when I joined, I was the only Democrat. And most of what we were doing back then was bipartisan. We all got along together. We, after a meeting, we might all go out to lunch. We were all on a collegial basis. Sometimes the House and the Senate, there's a real difference and, and you know, there's a real tension between the Democrats and the Republicans in the House and the Senate, and there still is. But there never was on the council until this year. We are three Democrats and two Republicans, and my, 
Yes. Is it voting done by a simple majority? Uh, for the council, for any items that come before the council, the governor needs three votes to get anything done. So the governor needs to be able to count to three. Not too difficult for most people. <laughs> so um, we, uh, my colleagues are Andrew Valinsky. Some of you may know him. He may be running for governor and leaving the council. He lives in Concord and uh, represents a, a very gerrymandered district. My district is gerrymandered as well, but his is very gerrymandered. His district starts in the Massachusetts and Vermont and goes all the way over, like a ribbon across the state, to Maine and Massachusetts. It's a very gerrymandered district. Didn't used to be that way, but in 2010, the last time we redistricted, the Republicans were in control of the House and the Senate, and they drew these districts to include most Democratic communities in his district, and then took from the rest of the districts the Democratic communities that they could. So my district was considerably more difficult after that last uh, redistricting for someone like me, a Democrat, to get elected. And the other districts were too, because the Democratic dis the towns were put in this one district. And there really is very little um, uh, interest in the, the, like Keene over on the west and Portsmouth over on the right. So they're not communities of interest. Nashua and Keene have been in the same district for over 100 years. After this gerrymandering, Keene was no longer in my district, District 5. Now, to my benefit, I got Hudson and Litchfield, but I lost Keene, which is, was a lovely community, and I enjoyed representing them. Um, I like my district now. I like going out and meeting people. But let me tell you a little bit about how Andrew Valinsky and Michael Cryans, the other Democrat from the North Country, have formed a firewall against some of the um, uh, people that the governor has appointed or has wanted to appoint. And I'll tell you maybe three or four brief stories about that. So first of all, the governor nominates individuals to sit on our courts. We have a five-member Supreme Court, we have a Superior Court, and we have a District Court, which is called now a Circuit Court. So there was an opening on our Supreme Court and the governor nominated his attorney general, Gordon McDonald, to fill that seat. And um, we had a public hearing because we have public hearings on judicial nominees. And after the public hearing, my two colleagues, Andrew Valinsky and Michael Cryans, and I decided that this individual, Gordon McDonald, was not a good fit right now for the Supreme Court. The governor had made two very conservative political nominations just in the last year. And here was another very conservative person being nominated. And so we decided that this was not a good fit. And so the three of us were no votes. God bless you. We're no votes. And there were two um, yes votes. The two Republicans decided to vote yes. Um, I went in to talk to the governor because, before to let him know that his nominee did not have the support. And so in order to save the nominee some embarrassment by bringing the vote forward, I suggested that the governor might remove the nominee, not bring him forward, and the governor wouldn't hear of that. So he brought forward the nominee. So he made the three of us make statements about why we did not think this nominee was a good fit. And um, I thought that was very unfortunate. And then the governor, after we, we did not vote for his nominee, blamed the Democrats, the three Democrats, as being political and telling us that it was a political vote. Whereas for me, it was about balance on the court. The governor had made two very conservative nominations to our five-member court. There already was a semi-conservative member, and here, he wanted to put a third, a fourth real conservative on the court out of five. And I just decided that I could not support that. And so I voted no. Um, in the last day or so, what was that? 
Thank you. In the last day or so, and, and, and from that vote, with the exception of some lawyers in Manchester and Concord who wanted this nominee to be approved, I have received mostly positive feedback from my vote. So, so uh, you know, I was glad about that. Um, some of you may have read, if you take the Telegraph or the Union Leader, that we have a, had a problem with our county attorney. Maybe some of you have read that the attorney, no? Yes, I have. Uh, the, I'm not aware of the details. Yeah, well, um, the, um, there was a county attorney the last two times who was not appropriate on, on the, um, to serve as county attorney, and the office was in disarray and was not very well respected in the county, and there were many problems. The attorney general and his staff recognized that there were a lot of problems, but really didn't do anything to deal with this former county attorney. So last year there was a, a vote. We have a new county attorney. His my, name is Michael Conlon. And he came into a very dysfunctional office and had, he's been there nine months and he's made many major improvements. But there are still some major problems that he needs to deal with and I think he's capable of dealing with them. The Attorney General and the staff, rather than call us counselors in and inform us about what was going on, I read about this in the paper last week the Attorney General's office came down and asked this current county attorney to resign, thereby negating a, a legal and, and good election. Because, you know, I, I, I believe that unless there's fraud or criminal activity, I don't think you can overturn an election. I think that's really bad for our democracy. So, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Litchfield. <laughs> Um, so, um, at yesterday's meeting, there was a, a, um, an article which we needed to vote on. The Attorney General brought us a name of someone who was going to come in and take over our county attorney's office. It would be a, an attorney that is an attorney from the Attorney General office, but he would come in and take over our county attorney, attorney's office. And, uh, I, I just didn't think that that was a good idea. I think that the Attorney General should work with this county attorney if there are deficiencies. Um, we should all decide that they need more money, they need more staff. Their caseload is twice as much as any other county attorney in the state. Their attorneys are carrying 160 cases, some more. The other attorneys uh, in the county attorney offices throughout the state handle about 75 or 80 per attorney, so it's way too much. We need more staff. This county attorney uh, presented a budget to the county commissioners who fund the county attorney's office and was able to get a large amount of money to hire more staff and is in the process of doing that and working out some problems. So I was not able to support the attorney general's um, coming in and taking over this county attorney. And I voted no, along with Andrew Valinsky, one of my colleagues. Um, the other colleague, uh, Michael Cryens, abstained for some reason. I'm still not sure why. I hope to find out when I talk to him. Um, but because it was two to two, the motion failed, and so we will not have that person be coming in. Now, there are still problems with the county attorney's office, and I hope to work with the county attorney and work with the attorney general's office, encourage the attorney general's office to come in and work with our county attorney so that things get up to speed, so that um, police issues are taken care of properly, and other issues that have been lacking. Because I really think this county attorney has been spending a lot of time trying to increase morale in the county attorney's office, which was very low, uh, increase uh, spending to get more prosecutors, and generally learn about his office in the first nine months. So I have high hopes that this county attorney will succeed with help from the, county at, uh, from the attorney general's office and, um, and with help from the, the county commissioners. And so that's my hope. And I'm going to be meeting with him regularly and getting reports, as I'm sure the Attorney General's office is as well. Um, so a small item that did not pass the council 
when we first um, started meeting after the election, we have a poet laureate in the state. Not many people know that, but the poet laureate interacts with high schools and plans poetry events. And the Poetry Society of New Hampshire recommends to the governor a few nominees, and the governor has always picked from those nominees. This year, our governor, rather than take the nominees from the Poetry Society, had his own favorite poet um, and nominated this person. And my colleagues on the council and I decided that this nominee, although he is a poet, uh, did not rise to the level that we have in the state, that we need in the state. And we have a plethora of beautiful and talented poets that live in the state and are willing to contribute. And the Poetry Society had recommended one especially. And so we voted down the governor's nominee to be our poet laureate. This is not a huge thing in the state, but for us it was because the governor did not follow policy that has been in place since the 1950s in taking the nominee that the Poetry Society recommended. They spent 100 hours vetting poets and choosing the best nominee. The governor's um, nominee applied for it with the Poetry Society, but did not even come in um, in any of the top places and was not recommended. So um, this governor, um, although he does some things, very few things that I approve of and, and um, does well. But um, in terms of counting to three, counting to the three votes that you need to pass anything, he has not been as good as, as I would have hoped. I expect to be able to advise and consent. That's the, our job, advise and consent with the governor. And the governor really has no interest in talking to me and as far as I can tell, the other two Democrats on the council, and as far as I can tell, the Republicans either. I think this governor is used to doing what he would like to do and just go about and do it, do it. And if, it, if he needs to veto legislation, if he wants to veto legislation, he just goes ahead and vetoes it. If he vetoes the budget, he hasn't really put in the time and effort to meet with the House and the Senate to work out a compromise budget. My worry is coming up that we won't have a continuing resolution because the money will expire. Tax rates will go up because the state is not funding what it ought to be funding in the budget. And um, it will be a real mess. Um, so, um, I think that's all I have to talk about, but I am willing to answer any questions that you have about the council, about me, um, anything else. Yes? How can the public, um, do, can they come to see your meetings and can they have input? Absolutely. So, we hold public hearings on judicial nominees and nominees to be on our Public Utilities Commission. We hold those uh, hearings by law. As a matter of fact, when I was in the State Senate, I was the sponsor of a bill to demand that hearings be held on judicial nominees. Before 1998, the criteria for being a judge was your friendship with the governor. So now we have public hearings. There's a chance for the public to come in and, and talk about why a particular judicial nominee is good or not good. And we counsel listen. Um, there's also an opportunity to call us if you don't feel comfortable uh, speaking in public. Um, now we also hold public hearings. I started holding public hearings in 2005 when I first joined the council on agency heads the people that the governor nominates to head up our agencies. Because it occurred to me that the public should have a say in who's going to head up the Attorney General's Office, Department of Revenue, Department of Environmental Services, all of these important state agencies. And it also sent a message to the governor's nominees that you may be nominated by the governor, but you really work for all of us, and we're going to hold public hearings so that people can come in and talk to us about your qualifications, and we can see how you, the nominee, respond to difficult questions that we ask and respond to criticism or even accolades. So I think that's been really successful, and I was pleased that during the four years I was retired with my hip, 
the council continued to hold public hearings, even though they're not mandated by law. Uh -uh. Now, after every meeting, I send out an email to my constituents talking about the issues that we have voted on that might affect the towns in my district. So if any of you, many of you might get those um, emails. I don't know whether any of you are on the list, but if you, you get them. Okay, so if anybody else wants to get those emails that I send out after every meeting, just give me a piece of paper with your email address on it, and I will add you to the email list. Some people find it really interesting, and then I usually hear from some people about why it was a good vote that I made or why I made a terrible mistake and don't ever do that again. So one of the but, I was thinking is to distribute on the or list or quota distribute your letters. So when you send me a letter so I can distribute to all the thoughts on Democrats. The email, right? The email. The, yeah. Do you get the, my I emails? Okay, so you, you might send it out to yeah, your group, yeah. yeah, and anyone can get it. Anyone in Hudson can get these emails. If you just send me an email with your email address, I'd be happy to send them to anyone. What, what issue has brought in the most public um, support or condemnation? What, what issue has really got more, most people involved? This issue, it's been the Supreme Court nominee. We have heard from many, many people who supported the nominee and why, and many, many people who did not support the nominee. So my issue was the balance on the court. I don't think we should have five conservative justices on the court, or even four. And I can tell you in the past, Democratic governors, like Governor Hassan and Governor Lynch, um, and Governor Shaheen nominated Republicans to be on our highest court. And when I was on the council, if I thought they were qualified, I voted for them, and I voted for most of them. But they were not very political Republican or very political Democratic activists. I, I believe that it's not a good idea to have very partisan activist people on our Supreme Court. I think you should have to choose. Either you're going to be in politics or you're going to be on the court. Well, elections have consequences. You won the election, and guess what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. get to call the shot. Right. So that's, right. That's, that's fair and yeah. exactly what we want. Yeah. And yet, I still want to work with our governor, uh -huh. and I have made a suggestion. I have made a suggestion as to who I think could get five votes on our council very easily to be on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And um, so far, nothing. nothing. Yeah. So when the three of that us vote. That happened a while ago. I mean, that, was, it's not like, that was yesterday. It was like six weeks or two months or. I think it was probably about three months ago. Yeah. So we were up in Littleton. Well, he, uh, at the same time we were voting on his nominee to be on the Supreme Court, we were voting on a good nominee that he made to be on the Superior Court. He had nominated um, a man named Marty Honenberg. Maybe some of you might know him because he was the chair of our Public Utilities Commission for years. And he was a good nominee, received a very good public hearing, and the five of us were going to be voting in favor. But when we refused to vote for the governor's nominee for the Supreme Court, the governor said, I'm not letting you vote on this other nominee either. So at every meeting, I would say, will you please bring Mr. Honingberg's name forward so we can vote on him? He's going to get a five to nothing vote. The Superior Court really needs judges. They're crying out for judges. There's a lack of them. And it was no, no, no. And then at our meeting over in Dover, about a month ago, he um, all of a sudden at the end of our, at, when we were voting on all the confirmations, he said, oh, and there's one more confirmation, and he brought the name forward without letting any of us know, the Republicans or the Democrats, or the nominee. So the nominee didn't even know that his name was coming forward. So, but I 
still like to think that I can work with the governor, that we can find some common ground. I'd like to hope that we can. I know you're shaking your head, but I. If he I, wants to be reelected, he better start playing ball with us. Well, I'm the up to that. Uh, everything else except him. Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. He's 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 living in fantasy land. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't vote for him. No, neither did Hudson. All went for Sununu and Hudson is very good. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we hope we can deliver mm -hmm. that I think we've had very good governors in this state, and the ones that do the best are the ones who can find the common ground. I think and you're right. People really like saying that they like living in our state because they go, boy, your governors really get things done. And I and I do know people in other states, and they're surprised how well you know things go along. And, uh, I say it's a small state, but people are very involved. Mm -hmm. They're involved in, uh, with issues, and yeah. we take the time to look at them. So mm -hmm. give us the chance to do that, and we'll do a good job. Yep. I believe that's true. Yeah. I, I think one of the reasons that we put uh, the, uh, we put the public access TV speakers is so that people know more about <laughs> what is going on. And, uh, and that is the main idea. I think sometimes um, I have been talking with uh, Republicans here in this district, and I'm not sure if uh, many of them, they vote really uh, with really knowledge of what they are doing. Uh, I have been knocking doors when I run. There was a bill that was presented uh, uh, one time about uh, using foreign languages in business. And I testify against that bill, the bill die committee. And I just knocked doors of Republicans. And I know they are business owners. And then I was campaigning. And, mm -hmm. and they say, well, are you Republican or Democrat? Go, I'm a Democrat. I'm a Republican. They go, I know. That's why I'm knocking your door. Mm -hmm. So I this bill, what do you think about this? Oh, this is terrible. Well, why don't you represent that this vote for this bill? Mm -hmm. Wants to pass this bill. So, and then, and they support me now. So mm -hmm. there is, a, I, I really believe is a, uh, we need to work better, the Democrats, is to, uh, to inform the, the, the people because most of the people is very independent. Mm -hmm. And I believe if they are get informed, they will, uh, they will have more conscious vote, is what I believe. Mm -hmm. So that is why I really appreciate that we are here. And, uh, well, I think you're doing your part to inform people by knocking on doors. Um, I think that knocking on doors is one of the best ways to run for office. I know that when I first ran for state representative and even when I ran for Senate, I knocked on most of the doors in the district and I think that helped. And most of my, my district now, it, probably most of them are independents, but I, I would not get elected if I didn't get independent and moderate Republican votes. I know that. And I think that um, you know, if you get out and you meet people and you talk to them and they realize that you've come to uh, an issue and you come to it honestly, I think people will respect that, even if it's not the same way that they might have come out on the same issue. You know? And I think if you're willing to listen to people, Barbara that goes a long I way. A lot of work. Yeah, I know, Barbara, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that is one of the challenges here because as a state representative, we run at large. Mm -hmm. So that is very challenging because it's, uh, uh, there is a, we cannot focus on one person like in a debate or something like that. So that is a challenge to run at large on this district. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult. But I totally agree, he's not indoors, he's the best way. Mm -hmm. uh, to do this. Also, I have a question about, it's about pardons. So oh, when the uh, government is a pardon, also it needs to be approved by the executive council, correct? Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, if you've committed a crime in the past and you would like a pardon uh, or an annulment, you need to file paperwork and the uh, issue comes before the governor and council. And we have had some pardon hearings. Now, if we agree to grant a pardon hearing, we have a public hearing on that, and um, we vote as a council. Uh, um, 
very few get voted on. Some of you may remember the Pam Smart case in 1992, probably before you were born. Yeah, um, but it was a terrible case in New Hampshire and she has asked for a pardon several times. Her mother has worked very hard on her behalf. Um, we did not grant a pardon hearing this time. Um, you know, I just did not think it was time for her to have a pardon hearing. Maybe at some time in the future, I'm not saying no, but this time is probably too soon. Um, and um, I think there have, I think when I, since I've been on the council, we have not granted a pardon, even though we've had several pardon hearings. Yeah. Yes? Could you help me find that list of boards? Okay. Okay. Um, did you go to the Secretary of State's website? Yes. Okay. Um, I will try to find the list and send it to you, Alejandro. Will you send it to, what's your name again? Mike. Mike. We, oh, I'll remember that name, of course. Um, will you send it to Mike if I send you the, uh, the link? Yes. Okay. So I also have a website where you can read my, um, my, my council notes that I send out after every meeting. So if you go to www.debpignatelli.com, and I think there might be a link to the boards and commissions on that website. You might have to hunt around for it, but I think there might be a link to that as well on my website. Right. Were you able to get it? Is that, the, that I think that's the right uh, address. Okay. Oh, you wrote it down on your phone. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what's the application process? Um, you would let me know that you're interested in a particular board or commission, and I would give your name to John Mellinson, who is the governor's liaison to the council, a young man, and he would um, tell you what the process was. It's probably a letter that you'd write applying for it. I don't think it's a formal application. There are so many boards and commissions. But I think you would write a letter detailing your interest and, and um, I would pass it on to John, Jonathan Mellinson or I could put you in touch with him. Okay. Yeah, but I bet there's a board or commission or several that you might find interesting. Especially since you're interested in land and land planning and conservation. A lot of the boards and commissions are, have to do with that. So I wish you good luck, Mike, and let me know. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate thank that. Thank you and very much. We are very grateful that you you came today, and, and Mike, we well, you a were here. We've presidential candidate so. next time. Yeah, we have next time. We have a presidential candidate. But you know, uh, there is. Um, I really very happy that you were here. Even more happy than have a presidential candidate. Yeah. Thank you very much for you all would, of what you do. I know you had invited me a long time ago, and, and uh, I'm so glad I'm here tonight. Yes, I'm, yeah. we are very glad to have you here. We are very th thankful with you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And because we're glad you came and talked about presidential candidates, New Hampshire is known for first in the nation primary. <laughs> so sure. you can use this while you are gardening or whatever. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That's our, Thank that's you. Our Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.